Hi and welcome to Magic Numbers. This is episode number 108 and today an exciting day because we are diving for the first time into the new format data. Uh, I'm going to be looking at all the archetypes uh, from murders at Karloff Manor and we're trying to figure out which cards are important for them, which archetypes are good, which archetypes show promise in the future and which are looking pretty hopeless cases. Um, and of course, this all is made possible thanks to the uh, sponsorship from mtgazone.com. I actually written down already um, large chunks of the seminar and published them on their website, but seminars usually are broader because I can't write 10,000 words every week. Um, and that probably is roughly what I would have to write in order to get all the seminar through the form of the article. Uh, this is also brought to you by the patrons and I actually welcome one new patron um, Searing Blaze, so thank you very much for uh, for your patronage. And Searing Blaze, they dove in directly into the uh, community, joined the Discord, asked the question, and we're going to try to look through at this question as well. Um, okay, with that out of the way, today let's look at the preamble. Mm, 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 mm. If I can find my cursor. And my preamble is very simple. Uh, eight years ago, a little creature was printed in Thraven Inspector. It was a one-two, it made a clue, it cost one mana, and that's it. And that card is probably, if you would ask people what card from Shadows over Innistrad they remember, um, they would say Thraven Inspector. If you would ask someone that didn't play like me during the uh, Shadows of, over the Innistrad uh, period, if you would ask me what card from Shadows over Innistrad I know, it would be Thraven Inspector. That card has become a staple of cube, vintage cube, arena cube, any kind of cube. Um, it's been reprinted in, uh, it's been re-released, the Shadows of Renistrad last year on arena. So we have the 17 lands data. Traven Inspector was a top 10 card in the format as a common, uh, as a one drop common in the whole set. Like all the rares, all the mythics, all the uncommons, that was in top 10. But people thought, well, it was then, you know, eight years ago, cards were not as pushed as right now. Um, and when Wizards announced that they're reprinting uh, Novice uh, Investigator, basically a copy of Traven Inspector, only has different types. It's a detective now. Um, it's still a one-two. It still makes a clue. It still costs white, one, one white mana. People were skeptical whether it's going to be as good as it was in Shadows over Innistrad. Well, we're going to see how it uh, ended up. Spoiler alert, still good, still amazing, still a defining card of the format, in my opinion, um, in terms of how much does it do and also in terms of how understanding a card like Novice Inspector is a big level up for players. I mean, I honestly have to say that like four years ago when I was restarting playing Magic, when someone showed me Thraven Inspector and told me that this card is busted, I was like scratching my head and it's like, why? Now I understand very well why uh, this little extra that it gives, this uh, multi-usage for it, uh, the body that is a, such a perfect vessel of counters, of, of, of auras, of anything, of potentially a champ blocker uh, that taps into multiple synergies, can draw you a card later in the game. It's just so many things on so much... Um, on so uh, at, at such a little cost, so uh, um, it's a good time for you to try to figure out why this card is so great if you don't understand it still. Um, so, as I mentioned, new patrons during Blaze, every new patron that I get uh, gets a chance of asking a question if they want to, um, independent of the tier, because not not every tier can ask questions, but I, I always give exception to the new patrons so that they can. Um, see for themselves how it is to be part of the uh, community. The question today is a very generic one, and I'm not going to dedicate slides to answering it. I'm actually going to keep it in the back of my head as we go through all the cards, and we're going to try to uh, answer it more comprehensively. And it is, how do pump spells compare to removal in the set? And it's a very smart question because there are two ways of dealing with opposing creatures um, in usual limited games and one of them is of course killing them uh the other one is just attacking and making sure that you have combat tricks that make the what opponent thinks are smart blocks into uh what becomes uh, dumb blocks and um good 
combat tricks in many formats have been just better than removal because um, you can just continue attacking, continue progressing your board. Those combat tricks are usually very cheap. And because they are very cheap, you can double spell on turn four, on turn five. You can just like cast a two mana combat trick, uh, cast a two drop or three drop if it's turn five and progress your board while diminishing the opponent's board. And you go wider and wider and wider and the game sort of snowballs out of control. Um, in this set, as uh, DMG uh, LOL uh, mentions in the chat, there is another dimension to it, and that is twofold, really. Uh, one, opponent's creatures frequently will have ward because they will be those face down uh, disguised creatures. So your removal will cost two more to target those creatures. And at the same time, your creatures will frequently be a ward creature. And because of that, you can play a combat trick on a creature with ward. And if you time it correctly, you know that you're not going to be blown out by removal of the opponent because um, they don't have enough mana to pay for ward. So uh, this sort of puts a certain advantage to combat tricks in this format. And, and we're going to try to see where exactly this uh, advantage materializes itself and, and, and how good combat tricks can be. OK, but before we move into all the color data, all the archetype data, let's look at just general overview of what's happening over those first five days of the format. I think that I did the graphs yesterday, so that's probably from the data from yesterday. It may be slightly different today because we have one extra day of the data. But um, I looked at all the decks that contain a particular color and uh, as, as one of the main colors and um, looked at how frequently they are played. And one thing is quite apparent, white is the most popular color from 17 Lens users. Uh, 17 Lens users are very invested players that know what's going on, that look through the data because if, if they subscribe to the website, they might as well watch it. So at least there will be a hugely and an, enriched fraction of people that actually check the data. So they know what's going on. They usually consume content. They are invested. They read articles. They listen to podcasts. They know what's going on. Uh, already in the previous season, white was uh, tipped to be the best color. And um, that's probably why 26% of all the games were with a deck that contained, uh, or 26% 20, of, uh, of the games contained white. Um, in a world where format is perfectly balanced, average would be 20%. So that six percentage point difference is actually quite quite a large, um, quite a large overrepresentation of the white decks. Now, this probably means that people who are not 17 lens users draft white slightly less. Um, and it probably also indicates, as we were going to see in a second, that white is just powerful, so maybe it can cater to more drafters per pod than the average. Uh, apart from white, red is quite popular. 22.6% of the games contain um, red, so also above the 20% uh, threshold. Um, and then blue is roughly on the border, 19.5, so around 20% where you would expect it. And both black and green are underrepresented. Around 16% of the games contain uh, black or green. Uh, and let's move to the win rates of those colors, because that's also important to take a look at it. Um, White, despite being the most drafted color, or maybe because it's um, uh, it's it's maybe the reason for it being most drafted is that particular statistic. But white decks had a much higher win rate than anything else, 57.5. The average of the 17 lens users uh, for the period that I was looking at was 56.1, so 1.4 percentage points higher than um, than the average, which is a lot when you think that uh, a quarter of the decks are taken into account. So those quarter of the decks are, on average, much better than the general average. Um, red is the second most winning color, uh, 56.7, uh, and the second most drafted color, which means, again, 17 lens users know what's going on and know where the power lies in the format, and they draft those colors, uh, especially early, because they are usually allowed to do so because those colors are open, because in the first days, you get a lot of people that are not invested. Um, they just draft because they feel like a draft. Uh, they didn't spend hours uh, uh, following uh, what um, Cortocalls has to say about uh, early format, or they didn't listen to the limited uh, resources set review or anything like that. Um, third color is green, which, if you remember, was one of the least player colors, uh, but it still has a decent 55.6% win rate, the green decks. And uh, blue is just behind it at 55.3, but blue was played at this average level. So uh, 
it seems to me that green is slightly underdrafted. Uh, but it also seem it, it it's also possible that if blue becomes slightly less drafted, it will improve uh, its win rate uh, in general. Well, black is the least drafted color and has the lowest win rate, which makes me think it might improve by better builds and 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 by uh, weakening white and red through overdrafting. But it will never be like a good color. It's going to be still at most mediocre. Um, yeah, and um, black is at 53.6% win rate. So that's significantly 2.5 percentage points below that average, which is quite a lot. And Graham uh, in the chat has a good point that black is uh, punished because it's a removal color and the word mechanics makes removal a bit mad. And especially with black, some of that removal is a bit more mana intensive, which, uh, which is terrible. Like, you know, shock is fine with word two, but uh, murder, not necessary. Okay, uh, MKM, and I put a question mark here, is a two-color format. But um, why there is a question mark? Uh, because data about colors for this set is going to be a bit complicated to read. Now, uh, 17 lands has categories for decks. And to be a main color, you need to have at least three cards that contain the given color and at least one mana source that can produce the mana of that particular color which in most sets is okay uh, because cards are quite obviously in a particular color. Now in this set, we have a bit of complication. And I noticed that in the first day that uh, Selesnya and uh, Golgari had more splash decks than actual two color decks, which is none other color had that situation. And that made me think something is off there. Uh, and that probably has to do with the hybrid mana morphs. So, um, I dug in deeper into it. I actually asked the 17 lands people what's going on with that. Uh, and my specific question was, is Buried in the Garden, the four mana aura that uh, exiles target permanent and um, uh, you put it on the land and that land gives you mana of any color. I asked them if this counts as a source of five colors of mana. And they said, yes, because that's how it's counted on Scryfall. And they use Scryfall data to be non arbitrary and have like uniform criteria for everything because buried in the garden gives you all kinds of mana in a deck that uh, has for example it's a perfectly pure celestia deck it only has forest and swamp and then plains um but it has three dog walkers which on the face value are a red uh, white creature but you can flip it for double white and that's what you're going to do in those decks but because you have also Buried in the Garden, which is a Celestia card that can technically give you red mana, uh, 70 lands will count this deck as a Naya deck because it has three dog walkers, so three red cards, and it has a source, mana source that can give red in the form of Buried in the Garden. And because of that, those color data are going to be slightly more wonky than normally. Uh, it's a good thing because it's much better that those uh, rules are uniform across the formats. But it's going to make the, the, um, uh, it a bit more complicated. So, for example, we see that around 46% of the decks are two-color, uh, but around 33% of the decks are two-color than Splash. And now the good question is how many of those decks are actually two-color decks that have buried in the garden? Or another card that might be causing problems is um, Insidious Roots, because they create the plants that can tap for a mana of any color, and, um, and 17 uh, and 17 lands counts that as a five color mana source uh, uh, spell. So it's going to be a bit uh, tricky to um, to evaluate exactly how this format looks like without looking into the details of the decks themselves. Uh, but still, even from that data, you see that roughly 80% of the decks are either two colors or two colors and a splash. Around 10% of the decks are three colors, and probably a chunk of those three color decks are actually two-color decks that have um, Buried in the Garden or Insidious Roots uh, in them, and a couple of those hybrid, or three of those uh, hybrid cards in any combination. And then roughly around 10% of the three colors in Splash, and you know 2% of those decks that are four colors or more, um, which is pretty normal for a two-color set. Maybe the three-color deck fraction is slightly, um, slightly over-represented. Um, in terms of the win rates, uh, Usually the monocolor decks win the most. Mm. From what I've seen in streaming, majority, like first of all, the monocolor decks, they happen very, very rarely. 
And uh, from what I've seen uh, from streaming, most of those monocolor decks are mono red decks piloted by one user NCAA who was hard forcing mono red decks and doing pretty well with those. Um, you can't really expect that um, you're going to draft the mono red deck frequently. So uh, you can just uh, possibly ignore the 62, 63% win rate of monocolor decks. Um, when we look at the other ones, uh, two color decks win the most, 58%. Two colors and splash, you already have a penalty of around three percentage points in your win rate. It goes down to 55, and then it goes to 54 when you have three colors, and 53 when you have three colors and splash. So it looks like a pretty straightforward two color format where two color decks are also the most winning years. Interestingly, the four colors and splash, so sort of maybe five color decks with, um, with the uh, colorless case, they do have like 54.5% win rate, which is not terrible at all. So, uh, I think that there might exist a five color deck in this format that is actually pretty decent and sometimes comes together and is actually quite successful. Again, small sample sizes on those because four color splash, 1.3% of the, of the games were played with uh, four color and splash decks, which is something, it's not nothing, but um, it's going to happen rarely. Uh, maybe the best thing for you to have there right now is that be aware that it's possible. Don't necessarily force it. OK. Uh, in terms of color pairs, um, in a balanced format, you would expect that every color pair is played 10% of the time. But Boris, already you can see, um, for those of you that watch it, 20.5%, uh, so almost twice overrepresented compared to what you would expect in a sort of perfectly balanced format. 20% is a lot. Uh, it means that people are hard forcing or soft forcing Boros uh, quite a lot. Guilty as charged, I did it uh, several times. I got a couple of trophies with busted Boros decks in best of one. Um, and uh, it was very easy to get onto those decks. I had at least four really good uh, Boros decks in my 10 or so drafts that I made um, in the format so far. And then I started to do some experiments and have fun, actually. But it was nice to check that you can force the most powerful color combination and actually trophy with it uh, quite reliably. So uh, something to keep in mind. Um, I'm wondering, it is going to slowly wane uh, in the second week, and you're going to have find it harder and harder to find those super open Boros lanes. But from time to time, you will still see it. And then it's good for you to know that uh, uh, Boros is the most powerful deck, which we we'll see in the next slide, actually. So I'm giving you spoilers there. Azorius was the second most drafted decks. And this, I think, is due to the hype before the format, because the numbers for Azorius are not so great. Uh, we're going to see that. They're not terrible, but they're not, not, not great. But it was one of the most hyped decks before the format was released. There was a lot of um, set reviews gave really good marks to blue and white cards. Detective is a very simple and, and intuitive mechanic as well. Uh, those tribal decks are usually slightly overdrafted because you literally are being told what to do. Just draft Detective and you should be fine. And 15% um, of all the decks were Azorius. Then over those 10% uh, that you would expect in a perfectly balanced format, you still have Izzet and Selesnya. Izzet was another of those hype decks, um, uh, again, with a very clear theme um, that you know you, you play artifacts, you sacrifice artifacts, you get value and stuff like that. Um, and again, it, it is not a weak deck. Uh, it just is not as strong as Boros was in terms of the win rate. And then we have Selesnya at 11%. Now, Selesnya on day one was 8.5%. Uh, and then each day it was drafted more and more and more. Uh, yesterday I checked, it was 12.5% of the decks on the day uh, before yesterday. So uh, it's becoming very fast, uh, one of the most drafted decks. Uh, because people realize it's good. It has very good numbers. Um, and this is an example of data driving uh, the metagame. Uh, while Azorius is uh, an example of metagame driving the data. And uh, last time when I did the stream, I was asking this question, whether the data is the horse or the carriage in terms of which is the cause and what is the effect. Um, and I think that in this format, we can clearly see that it sort of depends. And sometimes data will be the horse and sometimes the data will be the carriage, like in the case of Azorius here. And then we have like those, um, less played colors, Ragdos 8.8. Uh, again, I think that Ragdos is always slightly inflated because it is two colors that have good removal and good removal is prioritized 
quite highly by some players. And because they prioritize removal, they will end up in Ragdos more frequently because Ragdos has all the removal. That's just as simple as. Um, it doesn't have that great numbers and it's still drafted quite a lot. So um, something to think about maybe to mm, soft avoid Ragdos for the time being. I mean, if you open the namesake, don't avoid it at all. Uh, it's really good and also very splashable. So we do play that card, the 6-6 six, six, uh, Mythic that will usually draw you two cards uh, uh, at the end of the first turn. Uh, so don't ignore that card. It has very high win rate and uh, is a very good reason to end up in Rakdos. Um, it's in the name. Uh, but apart from that, it is also possible that it's drafted in the wrong way. We're going to look through the best cards in the um, color combination and try to figure out what is the plan for that deck and why should you be uh, doing it. Uh, Orzov 8.1. Now, this, this looks like a promising deck. Um, it's uh, maybe even slightly underplayed. Uh, but also in the next days, you might be expecting white to be drafted more and more, so that might be the problem with it. And then we have Golgari, Dimir, and Gruul in the sort of 6.7% kind of range, uh, all of those decks. Um, so like a third a third less drafted than in a perfectly balanced format. Uh, uh, all of those are sort of middling. And last place, uh, uh, as always, in the last I don't know how many sets, Simic, because Simic usually doesn't have a good identity, so it's hard to figure out what Simic wants to be doing, and people decide, if I don't know what it does, I'd rather avoid it. Uh, and, you know, for the most of the uh, recent formats, they were right to do so, because Simic was also the weakest archetype. But I don't think it's the case. I think that we are living in a world where Simic is perfectly draftable, and I'm a bit afraid of saying that, maybe even good. Um, and again, we're going to look at uh, that when we look at the Simic-specific win rates of the cards. Uh, in terms of the win rates, I kept the I kept the same order of the uh, colors from the most popular to the least popular. Um, and then Boros is the most winning and most popular. Hello, Mad Moses. Uh, nice seeing you in the chat. Uh, I, I will make an exception for Mad Moses because he's been in this chat since forever and since I started streaming and uh, was always all supportive uh, and, and, and an awesome person and worth to actually follow. Um, but okay, um, Azorius and Izzet are having slightly lower win rates. And then Selesnya, I told you that this is uh, an archetype on the rise and be it becomes more and more drafted um, as the time goes by because people realize it has actually quite a high win rate at 59% is the second most winning uh, archetype. Ragdos told you, Overdrafted, 53.8%. Um, you would expect that if it's drafted at around 9% of, uh, of, of, of all the two-color archetypes, you probably want it to be somewhere close to 56, and it's at 54, so significantly underperforming compared to how it's drafted. Um, Orzov is decent, not great, 56%, so just like be slightly below average, but you know that average is driven by a lot of Boros, basically. Um, and then we have Golgari and Demir, medium, around 53 and a half, 53.8, that kind of range um, uh, of the win rate. Gruel 55, I think that maybe will increase in the future as people figure out which build of Gruel is actually the good one. I think that the Gruel also has slight problem of rock, paper, scissors situation. That was something that popped out in the chat in the Alex um, uh, Corticals uh, stream, where it does pretty well with some of the uh, small creature decks uh, and, and and does okay with those, but loses to the more mid-rangey kind of uh, uh, solutions. And 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 if you, if you bump into many of the mid-range decks, you're going to have trouble. And if you bump into lots of weenie, you uh, actually can, can do pretty decent with group. And lastly, we have the Simic, but not least, not least, it's 56% win rate is in this tier two category with Azorius, is it um, Orzov and, uh, and and Simic itself, uh, which is a nice refreshing change. And I think that actually Simic is one of those decks that can increase its win rate and the builds can become uh, a bit more co coherent and plans can become more crystallized for that deck and actually can become actively good. Uh, so I'm pretty much hopeful that by the end of the format, people will say, oh, I drafted a sweet Simic deck and people will be like, right on. Uh, yeah, uh, which was never the case in the last couple of formats, I am afraid. Okay, 
first we're going to go a bit into general coral evaluation because um, this will show us the cars that are sort of universally good um, or at least good in three out of four uh, color pairs for that particular color. We're going to look at the best bombs, top and co top commons and top uncommons for each color um, uh, and, 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 and try to see. So again, these are the cars that when you're drafting and you are, you know, two picks in and you have two picks from the same color and you are looking for a third card in the same color. Uh, these are the ones that are going to be agnostically good in this particular color most of the time. Uh, there are quite some few cards in this set that are really good in one archetype, but really bad in the other archetype. And these will never be good on aggregate because, of course, to be good on aggregate, you need to be good in every color kind of color combination. So I thought it would be interesting to uh, showcase those. And I'm going in the Wooberg uh, order because I'm a lazy kid and I don't feel like uh, randomizing it. And um, I have it Wooberg in my hand and that's it. Okay, white bombs and bombs I loosely define as rares and mythics that have over 60% win rate. Probably I should have made it more aggressive even. The problem in this format is that there are not so many monocolored bombs. Um, because a lot of power at high rarity is locked in those multicolor cards. And they, they are, there is a whole plethora of multicolor cards that are having extremely high win rates. So keep that in mind. If you think that the card is a multicolor card and it looks like it's pretty strong, it probably is pretty strong. But white does have the most atrocious bomb of the format. That's Aurelius Vindicator. That's two white white for an angel. It's a 4-2 flyer with lifelink and ward two. So hard to kill, quite a big body. Lifelink is sweet because you will always win the race with that. But that's not all, because if, if, if it was like a four mana four to flyer with war, ward and lifelink, it probably would be like in a B range already. But it is a disguise creature, so you can play it for three mana uh, face down. And you can flip it face up for white, three, and X. And then when it is turned face up, you exile up to X other target creature uh, creatures from the battlefield and or creature cards from graveyards. And when it leaves the battlefield, return the exiled cards to their owner's hands. So you can flip it for six mana. You can target the biggest creature of your opponent, and you exile it under the Vindicator. And you can exile a creature card from your graveyard and also do that. They kill the Vindicator. The big thing that you exile for them goes to their hand, and the card that was in your graveyard goes to your hand. So you basically... Uh, create a situation when you can exile their creature and create enough incentives to let a Vindicator live uh, because if they kill it, um, you are going to, uh, they are going to give you extra value. Late in the game, you can do some atrocious things like exile two of their creatures, get four creatures, your four your creatures from the graveyard under the Vindicator, and then there you have an impossible choice of do I kill it and give them four creature cards? Um, and then have to still recast my creatures, or, or or do I let it live and it slowly kills me? Which yeah, it's atrocious. As I said, the highest win rate card in the format, I think, it can potentially be beaten by one of the um, one of the cards from the list, but uh, there is just not enough data on the list um, uh, cards to have their win rates. I'm especially looking at um, what's the Thopter, Thopter, ah, the ve vehicle, what's the name? You see how I'm not a pioneer player, there you go, and I didn't play in that era. But there is the colorless, uh, smuggler's copter, smuggler's copter, thank you to Jordan. Um, but there's just not enough data for that card. And uh, I think that there's a ranger captain of EOS or some kind of ranger of EOS. Uh, that card, I looked at the data and it seems to me, just by looking at the numbers of the game's played win rate, that uh, it also can have like an atrocious um, win rate because it brings a one drop to your hand and it will be usually three mana, um, cast a 3-3, three, three, which is a solid creature in this format, and uh, put a Thraben Inspector in your hand, which is like a great deal. Anyway, uh, Voyak Investigator, also a great card with like 61, if I remember correctly, um, Game in hand win rate. Uh, it's a three mana, two four flying vigilance. Two four is such a great stat line in this format when there's a bunch of two twos for three mana lying around. Flying vigilance, and also if uh, opponent has more cards in their hand than you do, 
um, you will just create a clue every single turn. In terms of the white top commons, three are really, 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 really powerful. Uh, they are, I think, top three commons in the whole set. Uh, we have novice inspector, so the Raven inspector, uh, uh, detective instead of soldier as a type, which is good in this set because with the uh, with private eye on board, it becomes a two three, which is just insane. Um, Makes a clue. Clues are synergistic with many things. Uh, as I said, it's so cheap, so uh, versatile. Um, late in the game, it just becomes like a country from creature. It's just great. Then we have makeshift binding. That's a two and a white enchantment that uh, is an oblivion ring, but gains you two life. Again, amazing in racing. This is the kind of a thing that will beat those kind of gruel large creature decks because you take the big stuff that they invested like nine mana in and, uh, and turn it into two life for you. Great. And inside source, uh, two and a white uh, human citizen, but it comes with a two two uh, detective friend. And also, um, it is a one one. Uh, the detective is a two two, so three 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 um, stats over two bodies, which is great. And it's a relevant actual skill. Uh, three and a tap, uh, you can give target detective you control plus two plus O and vigilance until end of turn. Activate only as a sorcery. So if you have any of those flying de uh, detectives or even like novice inspector can become a three two uh, vigilance, and three two vigilance eventually will require some blocks. And in most of the games, um, the three two will trade with almost anything. And then once you trade novice inspector, you can just start doing it with another um, detective that you have on the battlefield and and continue. Inside source becomes this kind of an annoying um, uh, annoying equipment. It's mana intensive, but at certain stage of the game, you just don't care that much. In terms of uncommons, Neighborhood Guardian, um, two mana for a 2-2, two -two, which is great in this format, by the way, just the two mana 2-2 two -two is good. But this one is so much better than that. Whenever another creature with power two or less enters the battlefield under your control target, creature you control gets plus one, plus one until end of turn. You drop this on turn two, you play a morph on turn three and attack with a 3-3 three -three, uh, unicorn. Um, if that morph was a dog walker, next turn opponent will have some impossible blocks to, to make. Uh, it's just going to end pretty badly. Um, I think my best carve out in the format so far was uh, turn two, neighborhood guardian, turn three, disguised the dog walker, turn four, I played pre combat, the second neighborhood guardian attacked with the dog walker, um, uh, uh, still um, disguised, and, and, and the three three unicorn. And then what, what are they going to do? If they block, I'm just going to unflip the dog walker and put plus four, plus four of stats around uh, to make sure that all of my stuff is going to survive and all of their things are going to die. If they don't block, they are just uh, getting done for nine, um, which is indeed what happened in that game ended pretty quickly after that. Um, Case of the Gateway Express, another great card, especially in this Boros kind of go wide deck or Selesnya go wide deck or... Um, any kind of deck that can produce a, a lot of bodies. Uh, two mana for a case. Um, when it enters the battlefield, each creature you control um, deals one damage to um, uh, uh, to a target creature. So if you have like four creatures, you kill something. Um, frequently, like what I did several times is I play two drop and a disguise creature on the play on turn four. I cast Case of the Gateway Express, targeting uh, a disguised creature, and I pay the ward cost uh, and, and and kill their disguised creature and swing with my uh, uh, with my uh, with my two drop and, um, and and the disguised creature and just create this life advantage that basically works as my defense because I managed to already probably get in for like six damage. Opponent is going to have. Uh, very limited opportunity of attacking back uh, because they will be always on the back foot. And then I can start slowly building up my board uh, to a situation where I can uh, play a combat trick, play one of those plus two, plus one effects or plus one, plus one effects um, that I can get. And um, yeah, it puts you in such a great uh, position. And of course, if you manage to cast it on like turn five and swing with three creatures at the same time, you solve it. Once you solve it, all your creatures perpetually get like plus one, plus oh. Uh, uh, if the case is uh, on the battlefield. So um, so basically a mini anthem uh, on power, which is great when you're the attacking deck because you care about power more than you care about toughness, really. And um, Leonin Relic Warder is um, um, in the top three of the uncommons. That's a card from the list. It's a white-white for a 2-2, and when it ETBs, you can exile target artifact or enchantment. 
And that's relevant because you very often will just, even if you eat a clue, you feel great about yourself that you did it. And sometimes you're going to uh, kill the makeshift binding or um, uh, or uh, bury it in the garden and get back a permanent of yours. Now, of course, then you have to keep in mind that if you lose the Leon Relic Warder, that enchantment is going to return and then maybe nap something back. But sometimes it's just enough to win the game uh, if you manage to. Blue. Bombs. Cryptic Code is the top uh, blue card. Uh, that's the... Um, Equipment that, well, basically when it ETBs, you take the top card of your library and you make it into a 2-2 um, um, morph creature. And uh, you can unflip that card uh, for its um, for its mana value, if it's a creature. But if it's not, you can just keep it as a morph. And for two, you can, for one and a blue, you can return the uh, cryptic code to your hand and then you can recast it. So you can just basically generate the top of your library becomes like a sort of like a stash of, of two twos. Also, the equipped creature uh, from Cryptico cannot be blocked, which is uh, which is just great. Like especially, I love this card with um, with the two mana two one, the blue um, uh, bubble something uh, fish octopus, because when it becomes um, cloaked, you can uncloak it for its um, uh, for its mana value, which is two, and then if it gets flipped, uh, you put pl four plus one plus one counters on that uh, thing. Uh, so you all of a sudden get like a six power unblockable creature uh, for quite cheap uh, if you manage to if you manage to get that combo. Steam Core Scholar, that's a three mana, uh, two and a blue flank vigilance two two. When it ETBs, you draw two cards and then you discard two cards unless you discard an instant, a sorcery, um, or a creature card of flying. I just realized listening to the podcast that this looks like a custom made line of text for uh, is it Phoenix. Because you basically can discard any of the things that Is it Phoenix has in the deck, including the Phoenix, which is just perfect for 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 that. So I, I guess that that was the rationale of putting that creature with flying text on on the card to to make it as a potential card for for Phoenix decks. But still, it's really great in um, in limited two, a really good body like two two flying vigilance and uh, some card selection or even card advantage if you have um, instance that you actually want to get into graveyard or something. Uh, and intrude of the on the mind. That's a mythic uh, three blue blue for an instant. Reveal the top five cards of your library and separate them into two piles. Opponent chooses one of those piles. And that card has been cast against me three times. And three times I had to give my opponent five cards because I couldn't handle a five five flyer if I if if, if, if I gave them zero cards. Uh, because it does create the flying creature that is as big as the number of cards that they put in the graveyard, so the ones that you didn't select for them. A uh, great card, uh, high win rate, uh, play that, it's amazing. Uh, yeah, yeah. I wrote a tweet about uh, zero five piles before the card, when the card was spoiled, and people were making fun of me that it will never happen, the 5-0 piles. All the time it happens, the 5-0 piles. It's probably the most common division of the piles. I, I want to be recognized for being right, for the people that tell me that it's not going to happen. Anyway, Projector Inspector is the top blue common, and that is a bit of a surprise to me. I knew that this card is going to be solid, but it's more solid than I thought. Uh, it's two and a blue for a 3-2 when it ETBs, or when another detective enters the battlefield, or whenever a detective uh, you control is turned face up, you may loot, basically. And, um, and that's a great ability. Also, I figured out a very neat combo with it, uh, you just need this uh, chalk outline, which is the green enchantment that whenever a card leaves your creature card leaves your graveyard, you make a two-two detective and you investigate. And you need the uh, curious cadaver, the uh, Demir three-one flyer. And um, whenever you sacrifice a clue, uh, you can return it from your graveyard to your hand. So when you have those, you can basically loot the cadaver, uh, sack a clue. Then you return the cadaver to your hand. Um, when you return the cadaver to your hand, you make a detective and a clue. You make a detective so you can loot, uh, and then you can discard the cadaver again. And then when you discover the cadaver again, you can sacrifice the clue, and then you can return the... You see how it goes. It's basically you um, end up in a game state that uh, as long as you have the projector inspector uh, in play, um, you create as many 2-2 two -two detectives every turn um, as you have... Um, half of your mana, basically. And you also draw a bunch of cards and then uh, uh, take over the game. Sweet combo. 
Uh, outside of it, it's just a good generic card, so just play it. Um, unauthorized Exit is the second most winning blue common. That was a bit of a surprise. Uh, two mana bounce spell that has surveilled. That's it. Instant speed. Pretty okay, but um, I thought it would be like, you know, one of those 54, 5, 54% kind of win rate cards. It turned out to be slightly better than that. Um, it might be the effect of the early format when people don't play around it at all and you can do some atrocious things by playing it. Uh, but it could be other reasons. It, it might be that um, it's good against, uh, for example, combat tricks that we were talking. It is, in a way, uh, a, a sort of combat trick. And third best blue common is one of the cards from the list. It's uh, Hard Evidence, which is basically a 0-3 version of Traben Inspector. Uh, create a 0-3 blue crap creature token, investigate. It's really good for your controlling decks. O3 will block those um, uh, morph creatures very efficiently, and um, the clue will be useful later in the game when you can crack it and, and, and get extra cards. So yeah, play hard evidence in your blue decks, especially if you're on the slower side of the spectrum. But even if not, it's probably still good enough. Come on, where is my where is my where is my where is my thing? Okay, black bombs only one on the list. Uh, Vein Ripper card is busted. Three black black black. So they made sure that this goes only into black decks. You, you won't splash this thing. It's a six five with flying with ward sacrifice a creature, which is shocking. Uh, and whenever a creature dies, so whenever they even try to kill it, you will always get that trigger because they have to sacrifice a creature. Um, target opponent loses two life, and you gain two life. So just um, did I skip blue uncommons? Oh yeah, I skipped blue uncommons. There you go. Uh, I have a laggy computer and probably uh, skipped. Okay, let's go to uh, blue uncommons. Exit specialist, uh, uh, one and a blue for a two one. Can't be blocked with creature by creatures with power three or greater. So um, against your big decks, it will just start chipping in. And it has disguise for one and a blue. And when it's very turned face up, you can bounce a, a creature to its owner's hand. So like great combination of packages. Early evasive drop, and then later in the game, uh, mana war that, that can also chip in for some damage because it might be evasive. Um, then we have surveillance monitor, uh, hill giant, but a hill giant that when it ETBs, you can collect evidence uh, for. And it has attacks whenever you collect evidence, not only from its own ability, but from any ability really, you create a 1 1 colorless stop their artifact creature token with fly. So, um, a good sort of value engine. It's not like super much, but when you cast it and you get the 1-1, one, one, you already got a 3-3 three, three with a 1-1 one, one flyer for 4 mana, which is a good deal. And if you just gather evidence one more time in the game, uh, you got another top there and it paid with extras uh, for its body. So um, quite a good card. I think that you should be aiming at a deck that will be reliably be able to cast it um, on a curve or maybe turn later uh, in, a, in such a way that you're going to get that one one top there and then you're pretty good. And Furtive Courier, that's a uh, two and a blue. Uh, Merfolk Advisor, it's a three two. Uh, can't be blocked as long as you've sacrificed an artifact this turn and whenever it attacks, draw a card and discard a card. So sort of like a weird version of the Projector Inspector that will be probably playing much better in Izzet decks uh, than anything else. Again. Black, the bombs is Divine Ripper. We already talked about it. The three black, 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 flying, word sacrifice creature. And when it dies, it has this sort of double blood artist. Uh, target opponent loses two life and you gain two life. A six, five flyer, it's just very big. The ward is atrocious. Um, uh, opponent really cannot chump it because it will still drain them. Um, can even stabilize you a, a very sweet card and very high win rate on that. Uh, top black commons. The top common is extract the confession, and this is something that is um, pretty symptomatic. This is the best black removal in a set with murder. Uh, but extract the confession. It's an edict effect. Edict effects are traditionally not so great in limited, but it does have a kicker uh, in the form of collecting evidence six. When you collect evidence six. Uh, opponent has to sacrifice the biggest creature that they control uh, instead of just any creature. And this is making the world of difference. Early in the game, um, if you're curving out, you can kill their three drop um, uh, and maybe, you know, cast a one drop or something or cast a two drop uh, at the same turn. And later in the game, when you draw it, you can um, kill their biggest thing. 
And at the same time, maybe you get some synergies with collecting evidence or something. So um, yeah. Importantly, it doesn't target, so it doesn't have the word problem. Okay. Second best black common is unscrupulous agent. Uh, and that's uh, basically the classic two mana one one that makes uh, makes opponent discard a card, but this particular version exiles that card instead of discarding it, which is actually much better in the set because it doesn't provide them with this kind of collect evidence fodder or, or you won't be able to rebuy the card that, that you exile with it. So yeah, pretty good. And um, keep in mind, black is the weakest color. So these cards are not like super amazing, but if you want to play black, you better make sure to have a lot of extracted confession and then a couple of unscrupulous agents. And the third is Snarling Gorehound. Uh, I really do like that card. I think it can become a very powerful engine in, in some sort of combo decks. Um, it's a one mana, one one with menace. So that will chip in for like three damage easily because there will never be time to block it uh, due to its menace ability. And whenever another creature with power two or less enters the battlefield under your control, surveil one. Um, this one can also create a nice infinite combo, but you need to mill yourself into oblivion and have a world spine worm in your deck. So uh, maybe let's not focus on that, but it's possible. Um, Okay, uh, black top and commons, and there's really one that is really good, and that's long goodbye. That's a one and a black instant can't be countered, destroy target creature or planeswalker with mana value three or less. Um, and to the question of my patron, this is the sort of removal that you're looking for in this format, uncounterable. So a ward is basically taken out of commission for it, um, and that makes it just a good card. Um, murder nowhere inside. Um, Fester Leech is worse than uh, Long Goodbye already by, if I remember, by like, like a decent margin. Uh, black for a Zombie Leech, um, it's a 1-1. One, one. Uh, whenever it deals combat damage to a player, you mill two cards. So sort of like, it's it's not a May ability though, so keep that in mind. So it can sort of like enable your um, graveyard synergies. Uh, but for one in the black, it can also get plus two, plus two until end of turn, activate only once each turn. So sort of like the wolf um, uh, in Midnight Hunt and uh, Crimson Vow. Um, and um, yeah, I think that in the first turns, this has the same effect as the Gorehound did. You're just going to get in with it because no one will block it because of the threat of activation. So just keep your mana open when you attack with it. They will never block it because it, you can turn it to a 3-3. Three, three. Yeah, you waste your mana, but they probably use it creature because they will play mainly two twos in the first turns. Um, but even later in the game, it can be relevant. Um, any way that you can give it unblockability is, is, is great. Um, uh, so yeah, a fine card and that milling uh, can actually give you some value in your graveyard, which is nice because this set has a bunch of cards that can do that. And number three, black uncommon. Uh, I would have thought, you know, uh, there is the five mana three three that you can sacrifice a creature when it ETBs to exile something, a creature or artifact. Actually, nowhere, nowhere to be seen. But we have persuasive interrogators uh, for a black black for a five six Gorgon detective, um, and when it enters the battlefield, you investigate. Also, it has the sort of trinket text, but. Uh, if, if, if links, if, if, if screenshots uh, on the internet are to be trusted, people did manage to get it. Uh, whenever you sacrifice a clue, target opponent gets two poison counters. So you can basically sacrifice five clues and, um, and win the game. And allegedly some people have done it. Um, so it is within the range of the card. I probably wouldn't go uh, uh, all in on that. But, you know, if you play two persuasive investigators, you only have to sacrifice two and a half clues. Which is uh, which is uh, which is uh, which is good. Um, I got my uh, poison kill nitrous mob uh, in in limited and not in one. I got it in uh, March of the Machine by a combination of the black dragon and and Finn uh, the Fang Bearer. Um, two point five clues. Yeah, that's that's what you need. So basically, two clues and one blood token. And if you manage to do that, you should be you should be winning. Um, oh, okay, I'm just checking that I don't uh, jump over. Uh, red bombs, 
The top red bomb is Incinerator of the Guilty. I mean, card, don't get me wrong, is great. Six mana for a 6-6 six, six flying trample. And when it deals combat damage to a player, you may collect Evidence X. When you do, Incinerator of the Guilty deals X damage to each creature and each planeswalker that player controls. This card, if it connects, you probably won the game. Uh, the whole trick is to make sure that you can connect with it. And uh, judging by the numbers, it's not trivial. Uh, because it has a high win rate, but it's not like among the top five cards of the format. Still pretty good. I mean, you probably always should pick it as a first pick if you open it because uh, it's in a good color and it's good enough. But uh, you shouldn't be thinking, oh, well, how could I have not trophied? I had Incinerator of the Guilty in my deck. Uh, second bomb, Lamplight Phoenix. Uh, one red red for a Phoenix. 3-3 three, three flyer. When it dies, you may exile it and collect evidence four. If you do return it to the battlefield, tap. So early drop, but you want to really make sure that uh, if it dies, you got this uh, collect evidence for, for, the, for the full value. But um, if you do, it's an amazing card. Three mana, three, three flyers, just really good stat line as well. It can block. It's like pretty strong. And pyrotechnic performer, one in the red. It's a morph creature and it has disguise cost of red, so very cheap to flip. Um, it's a 3-2, and when it or another creature you control is turned face up, that creature deals damage equal to its power to each opponent. I was killed by that card atrociously several times. It's really painful when you're playing a slower deck and someone puts that on board. You need to deal with it very quickly, otherwise you're just going to die. Even if you have like a sort of like collection of chump blockers that will make you immune from attacks, this thing can kill you. Um, top... Red commons. Person of interest is actually number one. Uh, a creature that makes multiple bodies. Uh, we've never seen a creature that makes multiple bodies being good in recent years. Oh, wait, no, actually, literally in every set, best common was a creature that makes multiple bodies. Person of interest makes one menacing 2-2 two, two that cannot block and one detective 2-2 two, two that can block. Um, and it's great. And, and it's really good in multiples as well when you can just make the very wide board, especially when you have like stuff that can give your creature bonuses and um it is markedly only in aggressive decks and really really aggressive decks i think because if you're like a deck that sometimes will be aggressive sometimes will be defensive paying four mana for two two worth of blocking stats is not not great for you so uh make sure that your deck is tuned to play the person of interest and wants to attack and wants to attack fast and wants to put multiple bodies and then the card is just great if not, then probably should stay away from that card as far as you can possibly do and then and, and focus on something that can actually block in a way that is relevant. And then the other two are Shock and Galvanize. Shock one, so red mana to deal two damage to any target and Galvanize, colorless and a red to deal three damage to target creature. Or if you've drawn two or more cards in that particular turn, it deals five damage to that creature instead. So you can sacrifice a clue on your turn and play it as a sort of like Four mana sorcery speed deal five kind of well sort not sorcery really uh, adamant maybe that you have to cast it on your turn basically. Um, top uncommons in red torch to witness. Uh, that card has insane numbers. Like really, if you think that it is okay, it's better than okay. It's like actively great. One of the. Uh, not adamant, addendum. That's what I meant. I meant Moses. That's what I meant. Um, Torch to witness uh, does just so much. It scales great with the game because normally the problem with those X removal spells is that they play a six drop and you need seven mana to kill it. Well, if they play a six drop and it's like a six six, you only need four mana to kill it. And then for five mana, you also get a clue on top of that uh, that kill. So the card is just great. And um, uh, use it early, use it late, and it's going to do its job. And then you got the Reckless Detective, uh, one in the red for a, an O3. But whenever it attacks, you may sacrifice an artifact or discard a card. If you do draw a card and it gets plus two plus O until end of turn, so it turns into sort of like attacking two, three. Again, card much better on the offense. Um, and card that really would benefit if you have a bunch of clues running around, you can sacrifice them and draw the card for free rather than paying the mana cost of uh, sacrificing a clue. Uh, and uh, later you can let loot extra lands um, or rummage extra lands to get some more uh, action uh, for your deck. 
And the last one is case of the burning masks. Uh, that's uh, one red red for a case. Uh, when it ETBs, it deals three damage to target creature and opponent controls. And if at the end of your turn, if three or more sources you control dealt damage this turn. So on the turn you cast it, just you need to deal three damage with it and then attack with two creatures. And if they connect in any way, you're going to solve this case. And when it's solved, you can at any time sacrifice it. You uh, exile uh, top three cards of your library and you can choose one of those and play it uh, on this particular turn. Now, back to the Searing Blazes question about removal. There is a bunch of combat tricks in red, but they're nowhere to be seen in the top commons or top uncommons. But we see out of the three top commons, two are removal spells. And out of uh, three top uncommons, two are removal spells. So uh, at least in red, removal is still king. And it's, um, and it's just um, uh, working very well because the color also wins quite a lot. Green bombs. And I think that that might be a surprise to some of you, but the highest win rate green card is Hide in Plain Sight. Three and a green sorcery. You look at the top five cards of your library, uh, you cloak two of them and put the rest on the bottom of your library in random order. So you can basically select two creatures, put them face out, face down, and then later maybe uh, pay the mana value of those cards and then unflip them. Or just put two lands from your top of your library and have them as two, two creatures that opponent will be scared of because they think it might be something good under it, stuff like that. Very versatile card. Uh, two good blocking bodies for uh, four mana is just enough. Um, and the fact that you can also do some synergies, like again, the fish octopus bubble thingy that you can flip for two mana and make it to a six five uh, is one of the things that combo well with it. Um, card uh, is doing really well. I mean, it has like pretty, pretty high win rate. Then you got a sharp eyed rookie. Uh, one in the green for a 2-2 two, two human detective. It has vigilance. And whenever a creature enters the battlefield uh, and has higher power or toughness than this sharp right rookie, it gets plus one, plus one counter. And uh, and you investigate, so you get a clip. Mm, very easy to make a 3-3. Three, three. Uh, relatively straightforward to make it into a 4-4 four, four and get a couple of clues. So it just will accrue value if opponent doesn't kill it almost instantly. And it's still a 2-mana two 2-2, two, two, which is a great stat line, as I mentioned, in this format. So, you know, if you put this like as a 2-2 two, two, and then um, um, and then cast like a 2-3 a or a 3-2 on turn 3, this becomes a 3-3 three, three can attack. Um, then if you have a follow-up and you can play a, a 4 toughness or 4 power creature, uh, you are in the game. And number 3 of the green bombs is x Bane Ferox. That's just like 4 mana, 4-4 four, four death touch haste. And it has ward collect evidence for. So uh, for the early stages of the game, unless opponent has a tuned deck to actually actively collect evidence, um, you it, 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 it's got basically hex proof. Um, later in the game, it can be targeted. But uh, most of the time, damage has been already done by it because it's a 4-4 four, four hasty creature with death touch. Uh, unfortunately, it will also give some benefits for the opponents if if um if um if they have collect evidence uh, synergies and um uh, and can use your card to actually activate their synergies uh okay top comments in green fanatical strength again i don't forget searing blaze's question fanatical strength is basically um um staggering size um, plus three, plus three, and trample until end of turn, and it's still good. It just, I, I felt dirty because I did this presentation on top of my LCI uh, presentation, and I had to replace Staggering Size as the top green common from last set, and I replaced it with Fanatical Strength from this set. And uh, I'm thinking like, you know what, maybe it's time that they designed some really good green creatures for green, um, and not that the Silly Combat trick is the top uh, winning card. But actually, in this set, there are a couple of good green common creatures. Nervous Gardener, uh, two mana, two, two, again, good. But it also has disguise for just uh, green. And when it turns face up, you search your library for a land card with a basic land type. You can reveal it and put it in your hand and shuffle. So you can find your surveil lands as well with it, uh, which is neat. Uh, but most of the time, you can also find your splash color or something like that. Um, it stays the same stats, so it won't like surprise anyone in the in the in combat, but it gets your card basically. So for like four mana spread over two turns, you're gonna get a land um, of your choice. 
Uh, and looks at an eavesdropper that's three and a green for elephant detective. And it's a three, three when it ETBs you investigate. And whenever you draw your second card each turn, it gets plus one, plus one and gets vigilance until end of turn. Um, so uh, frequent pattern will be, you know, play it. Next turn, you sacrifice a clue, swing with a four, four vigilant creature. Um, if they deal with it, they dealt with it. If they don't, you have a three, three blocker left behind and you're happy about it. Uh, top uncommons, uh, and by far top uncommon green is a killer among us. It's one of the best uncommons in the whole set. So uh, card is just great. Um, you make three 1-1 one -one tokens, human, merfolk, and a goblin. And then you secretly choose one of those creature types. And then you can sacrifice this enchantment and you reveal the chosen creature type. Uh, if target attacking creature token of the chosen type, uh, if target attacking Creature is the chosen type. Put three plus one plus one counters on it, and it gains death touch until end of turn. So um, you basically create like six six of bodies uh, across uh, six six of stats uh, across three bodies uh, for five mana, which is a great deal. Notably, it also makes permanence of four colors. So um, if you're playing the colorless case because you're memeing, uh, a killer among us is the great card for you to uh, put in your deck because you just need a black permanent and you're good. Uh, then Flourishing Bloomkin, uh, one in a green plant elemental, uh, gets plus one, plus one for each forest you control, and it has Disguise 5. So you can cast it either as a two drop, that will be as big as the number of forests you control, or as a um, uh, two two with ward face down. Uh, and then when you flip it, uh, you can search your library for up to two forest cards and reveal them put one of them into the battlefield, uh, tapped, and the other into your hand, and then shuffle. Again, you can find the green hybrid, uh, the green uh, dual lands from the set because they have forests as their type, um, and potentially put them into the battlefield, tapped, and surveil. So a, a neat functionality on it. A card is pretty solid, um, probably better than people think. It's going to be bigger than people think more frequently, but you want to be on the heavier side in green when you play it. Like if you if you get in mono green, it's probably just busted. But uh, in um, in heavy green decks, it's also very good. And another combat trick: uh, get a leg up um, until end of turn. Target creature gets plus one plus one for each creature you control and gains reach. Uh, it's an instant for green, so very very cheap and can give quite a lot of power. Um, uh, to a creature. So you will frequently cast it in this like plus four, plus four, and reach to a creature. Okay, the bombs in multicolor, there's plenty of them. I picked the three most egregious ones, but there is probably like seven or eight of good multicolor cards just behind them that still have over 60% win rate. Highest win rate, Izoni, center of the web, four black, green for a legendary creature elf detective. Um, it's a 5-4, five, so 5-4 five, for 6 mana, not a great stat, but Menace, that's that's pretty good on a big creature like this. And when it enters the battlefield or attacks, you may collect evidence 4. If you do create 2, 2-1 two, black and green spider tokens with Menace and Reach. Also, you can sacrifice 4 tokens to surveil 2, then draw 2 cards, and then gain 2 life. Probably it will become relevant at some point in one game or whatnot. But I think that the main thing is that it's a 5-4 that makes two two ones when it ETBs with Menace and Reach. And when it attacks, it makes another two, most likely, of those uh, beasts. So you can very easily get to um, 13 power for six mana with this card, uh, which is pretty decent, especially that all of it has Menace. So it's a nightmare to block. Agrus Kos, uh, Spirit of Justice, two red white for a spirit detective it's a two four with double strike and vigilance and whenever it enters the battlefield or attacks choose up to one target creature if it's suspected exile it otherwise suspected so uh, you know when you cast it and you attack with it once you probably exile one of the opponent's creature um and then slowly well, I mean, honestly, if they can't deal with it, it will very quickly become uh, that they are dead and you don't care about how many creatures that they have. But if they only are capable of chomping but not killing it, <coughs> you can slowly accrue value by suspecting their creatures so that they cannot block and then eventually exciting them. And the last one from the bomb status, uh, Ezrim, Agency Chief. One white, white, blue, blue. So sort of dream trollery kind of casting cost. It really makes sure that you play it in Azorius. However, I did get beat by that card when a 
Golgari deck cast it against me using the uh, Insidious Roots tokens to make white and blue. Um, it was a sad game for me. Almost had them, but Ezreal hit the battlefield and that win started becoming more and more distant. And then in the end, I lost. Uh, why did I lose? Because it's a 5-mana five 5-5 five, five flyer, and when it ETBs, you investigate not once, but twice, and you can pay one, sacrifice an artifact, and it gains uh, your choice of Vigilance, Lifelink, or Hexproof until end of turn. So it's really, it's really hard to kill if you play it well, but also it can bring you back on mana um, while still leaving the blocker behind if you have multiple clues lying around. It's just... Um, there is a lot you can do with it. Um, and top commons in multicolor, Dog Walker is number one by, by far. That's the Boros 3 1 uh, with Vigilance, and it's got Disguise Hybrid Boros Hybrid Boros. And when it's turned face up, you create two tapped dogs. Uh, so, again, very nice split cost. Five mana of power and three mana of toughness. So, um, um, yeah, what's not to like in this? Uh, Granite Witness surprised me. That's the two white blue uh, gargoyle detective. It's got flying and vigilance, but it also is disguised and you can flip it for uh, Azorius, Azorius. And when it's turned face up, you may tap or untap target creature. So, can lead to some blowouts in, in, in the combat when. Uh, when you'll be able to activate it uh, after the opponent declared their attackers and um, and sort of ruined their plan. And lastly, Gadget Technician, uh, two blue-red for a Goblin Artificer. It's a 3-2, and when it enters the battlefield or is turned face up, create a 1-1 one, one colorless stopter artifact creature token with flying. A great card, um, not amazing, but 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 really, really solid, and uh, especially in Is it I, I can see it shine. Uh, top uncommons in multicolor, and here we have an interesting one because uh, two of the top three uncommons are cards from the list. Actually, in Maverick Top the List, uh, the best uncommon, uh, or at least one of the best uncommons in the whole set. Um, three blue red for a two two, which doesn't sound like a lot, but it does have improvised, so you can tap artifacts to help casting cost of this thing. Um, and when it enters the battlefield, create two 1-1 one, one colorless top tier artifact creature tokens with flying. So, you know, even if you have like one clue lying around, you can tap that clue. It costs four mana, you get uh, across three bodies, four power, four toughness, and, and, and two of this power is actually evasive with flying. And then we have Enlisted Worm. Obviously, since it's enlisted, it is on the list. Uh, six mana, uh, Selesnya creature, uh, and it's just a 5-5 five, five with Cascade. That's it. You pay six mana, you get a 5-5, five, five, and you flip cards from the top of your library until you hit something that costs less than six. And that's the whole plan with it. And I really want to see a screenshot of someone casting this and getting rhinos out of it, uh, because that would be hilarious. Um, and last of the... Uh, Multicolor and commons that I made the list is Gleaming Gear Drake, the Is It signpost. It costs Is It. It's an artifact creature, Drake. Uh, flying 1 1. When it ETBs, you investigate. And uh, when you sacrifice an artifact, you put a plus one plus one counter on. Let's go into each archetype and look at the commons. I always look at them in the same way. I look at the best common overall. I look at the hidden gem. So a card that has uh, most of the time, um, most of the time, it is a card that has that goes late in the draft, or maybe is somewhat unintuitive that it's going to be good in this particular archetype. Uh, it's a sort of arbitrary choice for me. And same with the trap. I usually pick a card that is either good in other archetypes, but not particularly in this one. Um, um, yeah. Uh, or a card that is uh, you have to pick very highly to get uh, quite a low win rate. And um, because of that, I think it's slightly a trap. Uh, let's start with Azorius, and uh, best common is Novice Inspector, no surprises there, 60%, 60.6% win rate, um, uh, it's just good, it's a detective, uh, it makes a clue, uh, there are some synergies going around with either of those things, uh, and it's great. Um, Hidden Gem that I picked is um, Unauthorized Exit, 
Um, it does have 59.8% game in hand win rate, but uh, I heard from the chat that um, today, um, um, while this presentation was made yesterday, today it already has 57.7, uh, um, uh, which is a 2% uh, percentage point drop, which is something that you might expect in those early days, uh, especially with the small sample sizes for individual archetypes. It can easily drop like that. Uh, Still a card that probably is worth um, mentioning because um, even if it's only 57.7, that's still quite a good stat for uh, for a two mana bounce spell um, with Surveil 1. Um, the trap I selected is Museum Nightwatch. Uh, and this card is, looks pretty good. And I think it's pretty good in Boros decks or at least average, but only has 54.8% win rate in Azorius and um, and you need to dedicate quite a high pick to get it because it goes relatively early in the draft. So, um, so yeah, be, be careful about overloading your uh, Azorius decks with Museum Nightwatch. That's the four mana three two. It has disguise for one in the white, and when you flip it, uh, so sorry, when it dies, uh, you get a two two uh, white and blue detective creature token. It looks theoretically like it would fit into the detective deck, but uh, it actually doesn't. So. Um, um, uh, or not, not as well as you might think. Uh, I, I guess the death trigger is just so much worse than an ETB trigger. Um, and uh, sometimes you will have to flip it and you will not be able to play your instant speed kind of interaction or whatever. Um, it just doesn't work that as well as, as, as you might think in those uh, the deck the decks. Uh, in terms of the key uncommons, uh, Private Eye is the best uncommon in Azorius uh, at 62.2. Uh, the signpost, the Lord for Detectives, uh, just a very, very good card. Three mana, three, three is already a very good rate for the set. Um, so yeah, uh, uh, doesn't require uh, too much insight to figure it out that it's going to be good, but it's not guaranteed that it's going to be good. So it's nice to see that it actually is. Uh, Hidden Gem, uh, Fuss, Bother, the split card. Um, Fuss is um, two and a Boros hybrid for an instant, put a plus one, plus one counter on each attacking creature you control. Uh, really good combat trick. Um, and uh, the other side is a sorcery for uh, four and hybrid Azorius, hybrid Azorius. You create three 1-1 uh, colorless stopter uh, artifact creature tokens with flying and you surveil two. So it's sort of like weird version of if you have a whiteboard, you play fuss and you make your attacking creatures bigger and, and you win combat through that. If you don't have a whiteboard, you just make a whiteboard. And this bother part is a very good impression of uh, Imperial Oath. You make three bodies that are evasive rather than vigilant, and you surveil two rather than um, rather than uh, scry three, but a very close card to uh, Imperial Oath. And uh, that is a powerful effect. And also powerful effect because you can play different modes in different situations uh, in the game. And uh, yeah. Um, just a great card, and we'll see it more times in this presentation. I can tell you that already. Um, the trap for the archetype is Carl of Watchdog, the four mana, um, so three in the white, uh, three two with vigilance, and then uh, permanence. Your opponent's control can be turned face up during your turn, so you remove this kind of surprise factor from them. And then whenever you attack with three or more creatures, and that doesn't have to be the Watchdog itself. Um, creatures you control get plus one, plus one until end of turn. This card is really good in some archetypes, but here it just underperforms at 53.2%. Uh, so I would um, I would be careful about putting it in your Azorius decks. Um, and yeah, we will see it. We will see it in Boros, I think, or we will see it in Selesnya, or um, we will see it in one of the other archetypes. I don't remember exactly where it's going to be actually a good card, but, um, but in Azorius, it just underperforms. So this is one of those cards I'm going to um, make you cautious about, that they are good, but not in every deck. So if you're drafting white and you have a choice of this or inside source, and you still didn't decide which is going to be your second color in the draft, probably the inside source is just a better card uh, than the watchdog at that stage. But if you're like late in the draft and, and you have already your go white things and you're playing Boros, uh, then just slam the card of watchdog because it's going to be great in, you, in your deck. Um, 
Uh, thanks to thanks to Jean de Manuel uh, uh, de Pra for uh, for the raid. Um, uh, always a pleasure. Um, always a pleasure. Uh, I just noticed that uh, viewership numbers have increased all of a sudden. Uh, yep, we're just talking about the early data of the um, of the format. We actually started with the first archetype, so I can just show you. These were the uh, Azorius cards that. Uh, have the highest win rate. So Draven Inspector is still good. Unauthorized Exit, probably better than I thought before the format was released, has quite decent numbers. And Museum Nightwatch was a bit of a trap card in Azorius. And then in terms of uncommons, Private Eye is the best, uh, uh, the white uncommon. Um, Hidden Gem was the Fuss and Bother, which has really good numbers. And we're just talking like, this is a weird version of Imperial Oath combined with some combat trick. So. Uh, not as good individually at any of those things, but uh, because you have... So just Lollaman, I, I've been told by the chat that uh, this is data from yesterday and today's data is already slightly lower, but it's still quite high. It's still quite high at 58% roughly. Amnesia B, I think that's a good point. Uh, you should never look only at the stats. You should always evaluate it through the point of what's going in the format. But it's always important also to look at the stats to, to fish for ideas rather than to, than to tell you what to do exactly. Uh, and yeah, Karl of Watchdog just performs pretty poorly in Azorius decks uh, for one or the other reason. Potentially, you don't want to be attacking all in uh, from turn one like in other uh, white decks, and, and and that's why the card doesn't become so good. Also, you have more evasive creatures and fewer ground creatures, so you have to attack with the Watchdog. This is going to be literally the only thing that they can block, and then they will block it because of that. So maybe that's why it's not doing as well. Um, white black, and this is the only white archetype where a novice inspector was not the top common, at least when I checked. Uh, it was tied for the best common with the inside source. So I put inside source as number one, um, just because I think that it plays really well into what white black wants to be doing. Um, and white black wants to be putting a bunch of those two um, powered creatures. It wants to be really tapping into that synergy of small creatures. Uh, Snarling Gorehound being the hidden gem with the 57% win rate is a good example why. Uh, this will provide you with a lot of card selection as you play, maybe fuel your graveyard for some kind of graveyard shenanigans that you can be putting in. Um, and yeah, uh, this combination is pretty good. The trap for the archetype, uh, I selected Murder. Um, it has only 54.8% win rate. And it's the highest picked common in all the format. So you really need to sacrifice a very high pick for a card that performs medium at best. Uh, it's not terrible. You still probably want to play it and you still want to get it when you can get it late. It's just that you don't want to sacrifice better picks like, like the Novice Inspector or like the Inside Source in order to pick a murder because you think that you should have a murder in your deck. No, you shouldn't. You probably are much better off if you pick the Sacrifice Edict kind of uh, spell. In terms of the uncommons, actually the Fuss and Bother card is the best um, uh, white-black uh, uncommon. Um, again, you want to be going wide with the small creatures, so the Fuss part is really powerful. And if you don't have fuel, you can create three topters and you can get some value out of that because you might have, you can generate multiple bodies and maybe, you know, like you, you can get three triggers from the Gorehound and dig for something else that you, that you might, might, might be needing to, to, to get. Hidden Gem uh, at 60.2% game and hand win rate was the Fester Leech, which again shows me that maybe those uh, black white decks really want to make sure that um, they have some of those graveyard synergies and you can get something out of it. So maybe you want to be milling yourself and then casting the return to creature cards from a graveyard to your hand uh, for two mana uh, after you milled and, and 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 generate value through through that kind of stuff and if you mill the four mana return creatures to your hand spell well you can collect evidence using that and and, and you still get some extra value for that the trap for the um for the archetype was the perimeter enforcer because it does look good i mean it's like a two mana Flying life and creature, um, it has two or less power, which taps into the synergies. But probably you just don't get enough detective synergies in this color combination to make it really good. It still has like 55% win rate, which is not terrible, but it's much, much better in uh, blue, white, in in even um, uh, white, red uh, than it is in white, black. So uh, just 
to draw your attention that it might be worse uh, than it seems on the first sight. That's why I selected this at trial. Boros, I, we already talked, this is the highest win rate archetype in general. And again, Fraben Inspector, Novice Inspector is the best common. 64% win rate is just phenomenal. Uh, just shows you how way ahead of its time this card was um, in 2016. We talked about why it's good already, so we can skip that part. But yeah, lots of value and lots of small things that you can utilize. As I think that the better player you are, the better this card becomes in your hand. Person of Interest is a hidden gem. Not because you, people that sit and actually actively look at the data all the time, are um, uh, uh, not in the know that this card is good, but because this card goes still too late, in my opinion. Uh, it has pretty high ALSA, uh, and especially considering its numbers, it's still relatively open and easy to get. So um, that's why it's a hidden gem, because most of the general population didn't figure out how good the card is just yet. So um, pick it now because that's the time when you can basically chuck as many as you can in the uh, deck. And it's particularly good in, uh, in Boros, which is not surprising. It's the most aggressive archetype. And this is a very aggressive card. Again, I told you to avoid playing person of interest in any kind of defensive shell because two power, two toughness of, of blockers and two power of blockers for four mana is just a very bad deal if you're on the defense. Uh, but in Boros you probably want to be on the offense most of the time. So uh, it's just perfect what you're doing. And Sanguine Savior is a trap. I think it's a generally a trap. This card is not good in any archetype. It's not giving amazing numbers. Even in uh, white black, it's just like mediocre. 55.8% um, win rate is okay, but it's not okay for Boros that has like average 60% win rate. Um, it's... Just not doing enough. You, you need to invest six mana to uh, to flip it, and then you get a, a sort of like a bit of life on top of that. I don't think it's worth it. So uh, I would just avoid it for the time being. And you know, maybe when the format matures and people know what's going on, um, and they um, and white and red cards are not available, then this can be like the sort of like twenty third filler card in your uh, white red decks. But if you can avoid it, if you have other choices to put in your deck, I would play the other choices uh, for now because most of the time this card is very easily cuttable. Um, key uncommons, and we have the Neighborhood, neighborhood Guardian, 64.1, so the same win rate as the uh, Novice Inspector. Um, Unicorn is just great. This is a card that you need to kill on site, basically, uh, whenever it appears on board. Um, and just to jam them early, uh, I want to have as many of those as I can together with dog walkers in my Boros decks, and, and, and I feel very happy about it. Um, hidden gem I selected mainly because it was a trap in Azorius is Carl of Watchdog, 62% win rate in Boros. So you can see that uh, this card is just like two different worlds. Um, uh, in Azorius, it had 53.2. And yeah, hopefully we get more data. It's going to stabilize and we will. Um, uh, and we will know more about it. Uh, and the trap for Boros is the case of the Pilfered Proof. That's the detective-specific case. 47.6% uh, win rate. It's just very, very, very bad for that particular um, uh, archetype. And I don't think it's only because of the lack of detectives. And I think that you can have a Boros deck with plenty of detectives and still the card is not going to be great because it does one thing that you really don't want to be doing. It clogs your two-drop uh, slot and incentivizes you to play non-creatures on turn two. Um, because if you don't play it on turn two, uh, you will not get that many bonuses of the plus one, plus one counters. Um, and because of that, it will become markedly worse. But if you play it on turn two, then you don't get this early momentum. Like, imagine how much better it is to play the Neighborhood Guardian on turn two than the case of the Pilfered Proof. Um, because... If you play Neighborhood Guardian from turn three, you start attacking and, and, and basically uh, making sure that your opponent's life uh, total is going so low that they will never be able to attack you back, which means that you're always on the front foot and you are the deck that plays cards that you want you to be on the front foot, like um, uh, like the person of interest that we showed before. Uh, Case of the Pilfer Proof does something opposite. And then, you know, even if you manage to play it, maybe you get some bonuses from the, um, uh, from the detective. Um, 
you solve it and then you get this uh, payout that whenever you make tokens, you create an extra clue, which is, again, not something you want to be doing in this deck. You don't want to be grindy and play into a long game. Playing into a long game in Boros in this format, it seems to me like this is the plan B. This is where things went wrong. And um, you didn't manage to kill your opponent early. You have to somehow grind through that late game. But And we have to wait for the actual data um, uh, that will come up in a couple of weeks. But I'm pretty sure that the win rate of Boros is going to drop off dramatically after like turns 11, 12. Uh, so uh, the longer, the grindier the game, the less chance that you're going to win it um, uh, in most of the cases. Yeah, the other white case is just great and you should jam it in your Boros decks, no problem. Um, white green, key commons. And guess what is the best common in white green? Well, obviously it's the Novice Inspector, 61.4% win rate. Um, the hidden gem, and it's this is the hidden gem that you know probably not for the listeners of my podcast, uh, because every single set we got this green combat trick that is really good, goes really late in the draft, uh, has really good numbers. You probably want to be playing two fanatical strengths in your uh, Celestia decks. Um, it has 59.7 game and win rate. Uh, fanatical strength, if you don't know, plus three, plus three, and trample uh, until end of turn uh, for two mana at instant speed. Um, the trap. Is the Topiary Panther, um, the four green green plant cat, uh, six five trampler? It has basic land cycling for one and a green. And we are going to see this card again in a different role. Uh, but in Celestia, it just doesn't do very much. Uh, 55% is not, again, not terrible, but you would expect more for um, a card that is decent in one of the two best archetypes uh, as per win rate in, in the format. I think the problem is that. Here, again, you want to be playing aggressive deck that wants to curve out one drop, two drop, three drop, four drop combat trick. Um, and Topiary Panther incentivizes you to either do turn two cycle to get my third color um, uh, or turn six, you drop a six five that rots in your hand until then. And, and I think neither of those strategies align very well with what Celestia tries to do. So, you know, sometimes you'll probably get like a deck that wants to be playing it, but uh, you should probably look for other ways of putting big creatures in your Celestia decks that allow you to cast them uh, on turn three as disguised creatures and maybe flip them later. Uh, but you want to be making sure that early in the game you're progressing this boar state and you just drop uh, um, uh, drop the, the drop, drop creatures and start putting pressure on your opponent so they will never be able to attack you back and you will be, again, on this front foot. And especially, you know, with the cards like Fanatical Strength, you really want to have a board presence because you want to make attacks that put your opponent in tricky spots in terms of blocking and they cannot play around it. Um, best Uncommon, and again, we have Fuss and Bother. Uh, so uh, if there is one message you take home from this seminar, Fuss and Bother is a premium Uncommon and you should be drafting it quite highly uh, in the decks that contain white at least. Um, 63.7% um, game and hand win rate, which is which is really good. A hidden gem, and again, I, I do know that probably most of my listeners know that Killer Among Us is a great card, but it still goes really, really late. I mean, it's picked more or less at the same level as the uh, one blue mana, one one flying creature that you can disguise and flip it, and it makes some clues when you are, when, when when creatures attack when you unflipped it. Um, so yeah, Killer Among Us is absolutely one of the top uncommons in the whole set and uh, should be picked. I Actually, I'm, I'm playing right now a best of three draft and um, I just splashed the Killer Among Us in it because I had in, it was relatively a free splash for me to make and already played the first round and, and in both games I played Killer Among Us and, and, and basically won me both of those games. It's just like really, really strong. Um, and again, a reminder, it can make four, four colors of permanence uh, for, on one card, which is, which is sweet for some build arounds. Uh, the trap for the archetype I selected is Sample Collector, uh, three mana, two, three. Whenever it attacks, you may collect evidence, three. And when you do this, you can put a plus one, plus one counter on target creature control. It's just something that probably you don't want to be doing in this particular deck. I think that Sample Collector can be Okay, in some of the blue, green, or black, green decks, but not, not in this one. Mm, okay. Uh, blue, black, the key common, 
The top common is extract the confession, the uh, edict that can upgrade itself to edicting the best creature opponent has. Um, 57.4, so we see that like the numbers are way lower. So uh, you know, in Boros, uh, Novice Inspector had 64% win rate. This one has 57. Um, the hidden gem I selected, and this take with a big grain of salt, because when I was taking that data, there was very, very low number of um, of games that uh, the sanitation automaton was played in. But it had decent numbers, 56.2. And I think that one of the reasons why it was decent was that you want two drops in your uh, Demir decks to make sure that you can um, stop opponent from having uh, you know a free reign uh, going face for the first three turns if you're on the draw. And the sanitation automaton ability to surveil one when it EDBs is actually probably relevant for what the deck is trying to do, so you can get some extra value from it. Uh, but uh, yeah, you probably can get quite a lot of those and just put them in your deck because otherwise, what kind of two drops are you playing in this deck that can trade with the with the war with the disguised creature? Not many. Um, it's a trap card I selected. Is dramatic accusation the two and a green? Uh, Aura uh, taps uh, a creature with ETBs, and then that creature doesn't untap. And for blue blue, you can shuffle the enchanted creature into its owner's library. Fifty one point two percent. I was hoping that this card can be good, and actually, in some of the archetypes, it is good, but not in blue black. And I think that blue black is going to be when we finally get the uh, public data sets. Blue black is going to be the slowest deck of all the decks that we have. Maybe maybe black green or something. And I think that. The blue blue buyout clause that you can shuffle the card into the library um, is not good enough, I guess. Um, and dramatic accusation is going to be better in decks that can use it as a sort of proactive removal when you just tap a blocker and start swinging, and not so great in decks where um, you play it as a defensive removal that you tap something and you stop it from attacking you. Um, and the longer you play the game, the more important it will be to eventually pay this to uh, to blue to shuffle something back in. And uh, frequently, you will not be able to play that card on word creatures, which means that opponent will get some value from those uh, creatures because of unflipping or because of them attacking for a couple of turns. So, um, yeah, um, I think the, the slower the deck, the worse dramatic accusation becomes in it. Uh, and that's something you should be able to think about. Uh, so it's going to be better maybe in anything like is it that is maybe more proactive or, or or even Simic that seems to be a bit more proactive. In terms of the uncommons, good news, coerce to kill is good, uh, which means um, uh, at least they nailed the signpost uncommon. This is the control magic for five mana, but it turns the creature that you stole into a 1-1 one, one death toucher uh, with all the other types. Card is great, 60% win rate in this archetype is just great. So... Uh, Probably one of the reasons to be Demir, but also I think that this card is pretty splashable. So maybe like it's more of a, like a um, Sultai card or something. Uh, but yeah, really good numbers on it. The hidden gem to the despair of the Jordan in the chat is persuasive interrogators. The six mana five six um, when it EDBs you investigate. I think that's exactly what the sort of like defensive deck like uh, Demir once it's a big big blocker that gets you some extra value so even if it gets killed you're like not completely wasted the card um and at some stage you know you, you can outgrind the opponent and maybe this is the actual um um actual uh way of winning the games because you play those long games you get some clues lying around you just sacrifice a bunch of them and then poison the opponent out um it is a hidden gem because it has a high win rate and it goes relatively late in the draft. So uh, a card that uh, I want you to understand that it's um, that it's okay. Yeah, see, Dakon Star killed some people with it uh, with poison, and I think that this is a legitimate plan. And again, especially if you have like two copies of it and that you can put on board, so um, it can happen. It's 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 within range. It's not like it's not one of those situations that. It's a theoretical pipe dream. It's actually a realistic plan that will, you know, come up probably, you know, 10% of the time, 5% of the time, but it will come up. So um, uh, it's something that is uh, worth thinking about. The trap I selected for this archetype is clandestine meddler. Uh, 
two and a black for a three two when it ETBs you can suspect up to one other target creature you control and whenever you one or more suspected creatures you control attack surveil one now this is a terrible card for this archetype because in 95 percent 99 percent of the mirror decks you're going to be playing defense and when you're playing defense you don't want to give suspected to one of your creatures because then they won't be able to block with it so you know uh, uh, very much against the, what your plan is doing. It might be better in like white black decks where uh, actually making one of your creatures suspected is is probably beneficial or something like that. Or uh, black red for when when actually suspect can give you extra value on top of that even. Um, okay, blue red uh, key commons uh, galvanizes the highest win rate common fifty nine point four. Shock is somewhere just like super close behind it. These two cards are running neck and neck. I would say, I would probably, if I have a pick one, pick one situation, I would probably pick Galvanize. But if it's a pack two, pick one, I would probably have some decks where I prefer to have a Shock, some decks where I prefer to have a Galvanize. Um, in blue red, yeah, if I know I'm blue red, I probably would prefer to have galvanize um, because of the extra synergies. But uh, yeah, it, it, it will also depend on how many two drops I have and things like that. Um, Offender at large, I've selected as a hidden gem because this card is consequently good in many archetypes. Like, first of all, it's one of those morphs uh, that also have an ETB when you just cast it for mana. So you just can cast it for five mana, give something plus two plus two and move on with your life, which is good. You can flip it as a combat trick, which is also quite quite decent. And it has good numbers in those uh, blue red decks because maybe that's just exactly this one big creature that you want to have at your top end uh, to make sure that you're not going to lose to gruel decks that are going to put a bunch of chunkers. But also you have a bunch of evasive threats in those blue red decks, which means that this plus two plus O bonus can very often be a, a freebie uh, go face kind of situation. So it's basically like a five mana five four that uh, enters and, 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 and shocks uh, opponent's face because you have a one one flying topter or something that can get it, uh, get the bonus. Uh, so yeah, I think that I'm wondering if I will be able to do that uh, and, and, and see what are the win rates of each of the disguised cards when they are played as morphs or when they are played as face up. Um, uh, that might be interesting if to see if there are some cards that do particularly better when they are cast face up. And I think that if that's the case, Offender at large might be one of those. Um, trap, I selected Dog Walker because you have to start picking it early right now because people know that it's a good card. And the win rate is not so great, like 56%. It's okay, but it's just not great. So uh, I don't know if you can excuse such a high pick to uh, pick up a uh, dog walker when you can potentially get a card that is more on your plan in um, Gadget Technician, uh, which goes much later in the drafts. Um, and commons for the blue-red, and very good news of, uh, for uh, the signpost and common uh, aficionados. Two top blue-red cards are Gleaming Gear Drake and Detective Satchel. And I think that actually these are cards number two and three in this archetype. The problem is that uh, the best card, best uncommon in the archetype does not have enough numbers yet to have a win rate. And that's Maverick Top Tourist. But basically it means that the theme is working and you can get uh, really good value by playing those artifacts, sacrificing them. I played decks with the Gleaming Gear Drakes and Detective Satchel and it, it, all work fantastically, despite me notoriously forgetting to tap the satchel to make a 1-1 one -one top tier artifact. Turns out, absolutely needed. Uh, the deck was just uh, winning without uh, without me playing well. Um, and one thing I maybe to keep in mind is that um, I think that you should build those blue-red decks as sort of decks that can have those aggressive curve-outs but are not focused on being ultra aggressive. And uh, you are thinking about this grindy late game and Detective Satchel is such a great card for that kind of a plan because uh, um, if you have your early aggression, you just probably don't even need to cast it. You just can finish your opponent with gleaming gear drakes and whatever person of interest that you manage to draw. Uh, but if you have those longer games, Detective Satchel is going to be really, really powerful uh, 
even though it's like super mana intensive because it just gives you those champ blockers, card advantage, like a bunch of small things that it does pretty well. The trap for the blue-red decks, I select this Mistway Spy, the one mana, one one flyer. It can be cast as a disguised creature and it uh, flips uh, for one and the blue. And when it flips, um, until end of turn, whenever a creature you control deals combat damage to a player, you investigate. And I think that this card sort of can trap people into thinking that this is a blue-red uh, card because it can make potentially a couple of artifacts. But five mana to have a 1-1 one -one flyer and maybe get two clues out of it is just not a good deal. I think that Detective Satchel is just such so much better because you have this guaranteed up front. It's on ATP. Um, frequently, you'll be able to cast suck a clue and, um, and, and get a 1-1. One -one. If not, you can start getting 1-1s one -ones from the next turn and not many things will deal with it and not many people will try to kill it. So, uh, yeah, it's so much better. Well, the Mistway Spy... Many things need to go right, including you have to have like valid attacks, um, which is not always going to be guaranteed. And um, yeah, Mistway Spy is not good in any archetype, but I put it here in particular because it is picked very highly. It's got also like four, and um, and I already said uh, Killer Among Us has like four point seven or something in Alsa, so it's picked higher than Killer Among Us, and the card is pretty bad, which is a definition of a trap for me. Uh, Blue-green. Uh, here we have the key commons. Uh, top common, when I checked, was Projector Inspector. Two and a blue for Human Detective 3-2. When it, it, when it or another detective enters the battlefield, you loot. Great card, can generate a lot of value, can fix your draws, um, can fuel your graveyard for those collect evidence synergies. Uh, so yeah, all, all that you want to be doing. 59.1% uh, win rate, which is solid. Uh, Topiary Panther, I selected as a hidden gem because I told you already it was a trap in Celestia, but here it's actually good because here on turn two, you don't mind cycling it for land because it unlocks your Collect Evidence 6 cards uh, just by that and maybe allows you to splash because I think Simic is a pretty decent deck that um, can splash a bomb here and there um, from maybe other colors or maybe, maybe from your colors or maybe from your color and another color that you will have to splash in. So uh, all of this is good. I think that this deck is also quite mana hungry. Um, and um, uh, yeah, maybe you can combine it with some black recursion where you can get the Topiary Panther back later in the game. And I generally think like blue-green looks quite mid-rangey to me. It looks like this is the kind of a deck when you want to have good cards and card quality will matter and then the deck will work fine. And for that, you need a lot of mana and Topiary Panther will provide it. And you also want to control the board using those uh, collect evidence removal spells in um, uh, in green, for example, the the bite spell, and Topiary Panther enables it in, as a one card. Um, a trap, and that's with Breaking Heart, uh, the Investigator, the Undercover Crocodile, uh, only fifty three point six uh, win rate. I still believe that this card can be decent in some of the builds. Uh, the, the, the more tunnel tipsters you have, the better it becomes. And yeah. Um, just poor numbers for that, so um, uh, be careful about putting that card. It definitely wants you to be played in Simic, but maybe Simic is not the home for it. Uh, key Uncommon, the best Uncommon, is unsurprisingly a killer among us. 60.8% um, win rate. Um, yeah, I mean, card is good, makes three bodies, 6-6 six, six power if you play it right. Um, that's a good deal that you can get, you know, a 4-4 and two 1-1s uh, for 5 mana. That's that's absolutely above right. Um, then the hidden gem I selected is Evidence Examiner. And I didn't select it because it's hidden. I mean, it literally says Simic on the card. Um, but uh, it has good numbers. And um, I think that lots of people don't think that the card is good. But it actually is pretty good. It actually the win rate of examiner and the um, simic counter spell that put counters uh, on on a creature is almost the same. But I thought that there will be a bigger chance that people underestimate how good evidence examiner is, and it is good partially because part of its range is a two mana two two, which is good in this format. Uh, but later in the game, this thing can do amazing amount of value uh, when the game has lasted like you know ten turns, which your mid range deck as, again, in its range, um, uh, then Evidence Examiner is going to be uh, uh, something that wins the game. 
Hidden gem Lola is not because uh, the card is bad. It's just because I think that there might be people who don't estimate the card highly enough. Clearly, you're not one of those people. Um, Missway Spy, a trap again. 48.8% uh, win rate. Just very bad. Don't play that card, please. And pick it lately. Late. Okay, Ragdos. Uh, best card in Ragdos is Person of Interest at 57.6%. Ragdos doesn't have like an amazing uh, uh, Ragdos doesn't have amazing numbers, and I think that the reason for that is that it tries to do the same thing as Boros, but it doesn't have cards to do it because black uh, aggressive cards are just bad. So if you're playing Ragdos, you probably want to have the namesake Ragdos um, or a couple of other bombs, and just you manage to somehow get from black. Um, but you still want to be uh, going wide. Uh, Judith is an interesting one. It's five mana. I don't think it has great numbers uh, in general, but I've seen it being decent. It's just that it will be also atrocious many times, and it, 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 the body is just not appealing. Like five mana for a three four. If you can't get one devil, then you're then we're talking. But uh, you know, co compare it to like Izomi at the same rarity. Um, in a color combination that is not so great and then having like you know 65% win rate. Um, hidden gem I selected is the gadget technician because it's just behind person of interest and does very similar things. So I think that if you want to have a successful uh, black red deck, that's what you want to load on person of interest, which is also great because it um, uh, suspects uh, itself and there are some synergies with suspect creatures that are just incidentally lying around in, uh, in Ractus decks. Um, and then Gadget Technician is a good way of making multiple bodies. I'm pretty sure Dog Walker is okay in this particular archetype. Uh, so we want to go wide using whatever red can provide in going wide. Uh, you want to probably focus on playing those um, 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 red cards as your main chunk of creatures and then supplement it with either bombs or good black removal like the uh, long goodbye, I want to say. Um, trap is suspicious detonation 50% win rate even for poor archetype that's low i think that if you want to be playing um ragdos you want to be focusing on removal like uh, like the edict card or like the long goodbye or galvanize or shock or all those kind of things so um uh, and not the clunky expensive removal so um yeah uh, oh yeah key and commons uh long goodbye there you go um and trap soul enervation, a four mana clunky removal. So uh, that, that that sort of proves the point I was talking uh, about early. Low goodbye is the top uncommon at fifty nine point eight percent. Again, card is good, can kill those ward creatures uh, without paying the ward cost, which is great. Um, and is instant and is flexible. Uh, so yeah, um, definitely worth playing. And the rune blade juggler I selected as a hidden gem. And this is a personal selection because I thought that this card is going to be rubbish, but then I saw the numbers and it looks like it's uh, at least decent. So um, don't be me. Uh, evaluate this card maybe slightly higher than I did uh, in the pre before the release of the format. Uh, 57.4 still, like it's not impressive, but uh, you have to keep in mind that Ractus has a lower win rate than all the other uh, color combinations. Two. Uh, Golgari. Top common in Golgari is Extract a Confession. Again, like lots of black archetypes have Extract a Confession as the top common. So I think that this is the sort of like reason that you can uh, move on to black, that you see a bunch of those things uh, uh, wheeling and you, you're starting to get them. Um, hidden gem in Golgari, which was a bit surprising, was the Fairy S S Snoop, the um, one blue black fairy detective, the one for, but it has disguise for uh, one. Uh, Dimir Hybrid, Dimir Hybrid. And when you flip it, you look at top two cards of your library, put one of them in your hand and the other in your graveyard. And I think that in Gulgari, the fact that you put something in the graveyard is a bonus. Uh, it's, 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 it's pure upside for you because uh, you want to have cards in your graveyard uh, for multiple synergies that you might be uh, doing. Trap card, uh, Basilica Stalker, uh, six mana free for flying. Uh, whenever it deals combat damage to a player, you gain one life and surveil one. 
uh, and you can flip it, um, you can disguise it and flip it for five mana. I think that the problem with this card in um, Golgari especially is that you want to produce blockers and once you start attacking, it really doesn't matter because you probably attack with whatever is left on board after a long game of attrition. Uh, Basilica Stalker is really at its best when it's attacking because it only gets the drain uh, one and surveil one, sorry, uh, uh, the gain one life and, um, and surveil one bonus when it's attacking. So when it's not attacking, it's just a, a vanilla free for flyer, which is not a great deal for six mana or eight mana in installments. Uh, so yeah, a 51.8% win rate is uh, very underwhelming. And the card is actually picked relatively high. I'm not saying like it's super high pick, but it's relatively high picked. Um, so you might want to, you know, waste uh, something that is a better pick for you uh, in order to pick it, uh, just to get a card that is not doing very well in this particular ar archetype. Um, key uncommons, and would you believe it? A, a killer among us is um, the best uncommon in uh, also Golgari, with 62% win rate, and that's like far above anything else in this archetype in terms of uh, win rate. Um, I also selected Glint Weaver as a, a hidden gem. That's the seven drop. It's a three, three reach when it enters the battlefield, um, uh, distribute three plus one plus one counters among one, two or three target creatures. Uh, then you gain life equal to the greatest toughness among creatures you control. Uh, anyone already got 15 life from it because they, um, they had the mythic 215 creature on board. Well, that's. Part of the range of the card, uh, um, a six or a three three that distributes three counters and gains you uh, fifteen life. Um, but if you even if you don't like, worst case scenario, you play it on the empty board. You got a six six and gain six life, which is great. Um, uh, yes, this will be released as a podcast line open. Um, and in some situations, you can cast it, keep it as a three three, and put counters somewhere else for like very beneficial attacks or something or uh, to make sure that your blockers are well padded against a wider board and the 3-3 three, three is enough then. Uh, and you gain some life in the process. So pretty versatile card that requires mana, but again, Golgari looks like it wants to play the kind of grindy game. Uh, and uh, if you're aiming at playing the grindy game, you have a bunch of those extracting confessions and, and, and a bunch of one ones that uh, exile a card from their hand. You can assume that this is going to end up in an attrition game, and 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 uh, putting so much value on board with Clint Weaver is going to be good, and you will get that seven mana. Importantly, uh, case of the trampled garden is a trap for uh, that I selected. I think that this is another case of a card that says, whenever you attack, and Golgari is a deck that when it attacks, the game is practically over because it means that they out attritioned you, and you're just in the top deck mode. And earlier than that, the case of the Trumpled Garden does very little. Like um, it gives plus two, plus two for three mana. I think that you'll be better off playing the three mana aura that gives hexproof because at least you can one for one opponent with that one by countering the removal spell or something. Uh, so yeah, case of the Trumpled Garden, uh, if it's solved, you need to still be attacking. And uh, this is not something that Golgari, I think, will be interested in that much to sort of race with someone and get those counters. 49.7% game and win rate sort of confirms that, uh, that that's the case. Um, red, green, key commons. Fanatical strength is the highest win rate common, but only 57.8. So you can already see that this is one of the lower win rate kind of um, uh, archetypes. And also it sort of suggests to me that this is a, an archetype that will be very much dependent on um, on the uncommons and higher rarity cards to be good. Uh, because if the best common has 57.8, that would suggest to me that, you know, the win rate of the archetype is like 53. And this one has 54.7, but that uh, again suggests that those higher rarity cards are important. Uh, hidden gem I selected is Vengeful Creeper. That's a five mana five five vanilla, if you play it uh, on the face value. And you can morph it, and then um, uh, the disguise cost is five and a green. So actually, you pay more for flipping it. But when you flip it, you can destroy an artifact or an enchantment and opponent controls. So um, dual use. But I think that in this particular archetype, it might be just good as a five mana five five. Uh, simple as. On the other hand, crowd control warden is not great. Um, it only has 50% win rate. 
Um, and yeah, I think that maybe you don't go wide enough in your board in red green. And because of that, it will be frequently like a five five or something. But it it may be it may be also the case that um, uh, people morph crowd control warden too frequently. And of course, in red green, you might not be able to uh, cast it for its mana value. And when you morph it, you need to pay eight mana for the effect, and that's just too much. So uh, that might be the reason why crowd control warden is performing worse in this particular archetype. Okay, and the um, uncommons, the key uncommons. And here we can come back to the uh, Searing Blaze, my patron's question uh, about removal or combat tricks. In Gru, good removal is still good in this format, but tricks are not bad in, uh, in, in some of the archetypes. Uh, you see top common is fanatical strength, uh, but top uncommon on the other hand is torsi witness. Card is, again, great, 61.9% win rate. Uh, it does so much, uh, usually draws you a card in the process. Uh, but get a leg up, the one mana um, combat trick is also good, which, again, this, this ties in, like, if control crowd control warden is bad, but get a leg up is good, then it means that crowd control warden is just bad as a um, card that you play face down. Uh, you want to play that card face up, and in order to play it face up, you have to play Celestial Dex rather than Gruel decks. And if you want to cast it in the Gruel deck, paying eight mana is just too much. But because get a leg up is pretty decent, it means that you go wide enough for that kind of combat trick that gives plus one plus one for each creature you control is fine. And thus, uh, if you would be able to cast crowd control uh, warden probably for its nominal mana value, it would be much better. Um, okay, and um, card that is a trap is uh, Harry Dronesmith. That's the Three and a red a human artificer, two, three. At the beginning of your combat on your turn, create a one one top there and it gains haste, and then you sacrifice it at the end, at the beginning of your end step. This is exactly the card that you probably don't want to be playing in Gruel. It promotes this kind of like nickel and dimey uh, game plan when you have those top there's and they start chipping in for damage. No, it's Gruel. You want to smash. You don't smash with a one one um, token, token that uh, sacrifices at the end of the turn. 49% win rate for the Harry Dronesmith and um, yeah, pretty atrocious performance. Stick with it to your um, uh, to your is it decks. I think it is like fringe playable in Boros, I guess, and maybe some versions of Boros, uh, but definitely not in the Gruel where you uh, you know at, at, at that stage of the game you probably start want to start jamming four fours and 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 five fives and six sixes. Okay. Uh, that covers the archetypes. And now we go to the last part of the seminar, and that's uh, looking at the openness of the um, color combinations. Um, so every format, I measure the openness of the um, uh, of the color pair. By the way, there are some questions in the chat, but I'm just going to, because we're almost at the end of the seminar, I'm going to answer them after the seminar is done uh, in the sort of like post-seminar chat, okay? Um, so. Every time a new format hits, I measure this openness measure, which is not without its flaws, but it is also with some benefits. Um, openness is my measure of how many good cards in each color pair will you see per draft. And I define good cards every single time the same as cards that have a game and hand win rate of 56% or more. Now, the problem with that measure is that it's slightly tautological because good colors will have good more good cards because they are good color pairs and therefore they, you will see more of them. But sometimes you see things that are not quite making sense uh, from that perspective. So uh, colors that you see a lot of good cards, but the win rate is low, or you will see um, color combinations when you see very few good cards, but still the win rate is quite high. And then you can start speculating on why that is happening. And that, I think, is um, a, a good exercise in trying to understand what's going on with format and where you can gain some edges and when there are things to discover, for example. So this is the first set, I think, that I get this kind of super linear kind of um, um, openness metric. Um, the most open color is, of course, Boros, with the, like 49 cards good cards that you will see on average per pod. Uh, I calculated using ALSA and um, 
uh, and and the win rate data from 17 lands. So basically, the higher the ALSA, the more I will see of a particular card, and then I can calculate how many I will see them because I know how many of each rarity cards are open in the pack. Blah uh, da 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 da. Um, and then I can calculate how many I will see. Of course, the fact that I see 49 cards uh, that are good in Boros doesn't mean I can pick 49 cards because I can only pick 42. So I will see multiples of those good cards per pack sometimes, and I can only pick one of those. But it's a good indication that, you know, like when you have the openness of over 35, you probably can pick 23 good picks easily for that particular color pair. Um, so we have Boros at 49, then we have Celestia at 46, and then is it at around 40, and um, Simic at around 33, um, Azorius at 26, uh, Orzov at 24, and then we drop down to like 17 for Gruul, 15 for Golgari, 10 for Dimir, and 7 for uh, Rakdos. And then when you compare it to the win rates of the archetypes uh, that I showed you, uh, you see that it is sort of good connection between openness and the win rate of the uh, archetype, except for two decks. Uh, specifically, um, Izzet and Simic are winning slightly less than I think that their openness suggests they should. And that to me means that uh, Izzet and uh, Simic decks are very likely built not optimal at at least some percentage of the time. And that tells me that if you're looking for like the week two and week three decks, the ones that people will, you know, everyone will know that Boros and Selesnya are good very quickly. But if you're looking for that, those week two edges, I would start looking uh, for Izzet and, and, and Simic decks uh, to, uh, to get the edge while people are fighting over Boros cards. And probably because they will be fighting over Boros cards, that Simic strategy seems more and more appealing. So uh, I think that there is the spot where you can look through the data, check which cards are particularly good in Simic, and start thinking about how to incorporate that knowledge and how to conceptualize a good build of a Simic deck. And that they should be very open uh, in, in, in the next couple of weeks and, and, and can have a higher win rate if you figure out how to do it. Um, that's true that uh, uh, Life and Guard in chat says that Simic and Izzet require specific cards to build around and Boros cards overlap very well and double down on synergy. That's one thing that definitely is true. But still, I mean, I think it's a worth a thing that you see a lot of good cards for Izzet and, um, and Simic in drafts. And you just need to make sure that you arrange them uh, right. And I think that the uh, win rate of this might be higher than the numbers on 17 lands suggest. All right, and that's it. After a mere two hours, 20 minutes, uh, we got there. Okay, I had a pause and I didn't start instantly, so that's fine. We'll be probably within the two hours of the podcast. But thanks uh, so much for 17 Lens team. They did a stellar job without early access to figure out how the format works before it was released and everything was smoothless and seamless. And uh, it, it, of course, for the users, it doesn't seem like much, but I do know from the inside how much work goes into making all those sets work. Um, so especially Ale Ballini is putting tons of hours to figure it out. Obviously, uh, Viral Misnomer, uh, AKA Mr. 17 Lens himself, uh, puts a lot of stuff. Um, I would like to thank Fake Jake Brown, who is my um, good and kind spirit that uh, helps me edit the podcast and, and, and release it without my uh, mm, uh, mm, uh. Normally, there is averaging around three minutes of that that gets cut out through um, through uh, fake Jake Brown's wizardry. And thanks to Sesco and Mana Junkie, who are uh, responsible for the music I start the podcast with, and MTGA Zone for the sponsorship, and my new patrons, and in particular, Searing Blaze, um, uh, the new patron. Uh, thank you very much for the support. And with that, next week, let's see what we're going to talk about. Maybe the top players data. Or maybe maybe something else depends on where my uh, intervention will take me. But till then, I'll see you then. Bye.